Um, my name is Simon Soon, and I'm the moderator for this next session. I have two burdensome tasks. Firstly, under the strict instruction of Mustafa, I am to unleash Professor Sabapati unto you. Subsequently, I also have received an equally stern insistence from Professor Sabapati himself that I must restrain him from ever whisking all of you away beyond the point of no return in Kamai cosmographies. Am I right, Professor? So until I had the first opportunity to sit with, uh, in one of Professor's lecture a few years back, never have I ever thought that these stones Sure, they're monumental, but to my unschooled ways, to my unschooled eyes back then, they're just stones, right? Um, but never have I thought that they would actually launch me on a sort of like interstellar sort of like journey across the universe and back, as well as seduce me with lines, curves, and forms that ooze with an unbelievable sort of like amount of sensuality. But, you know, all thanks to your sort of lecture, I gain a new eye. Uh, well, in, in my first sort of like experience of Angkor. Uh, so what, more, what else can I say but to welcome the ever untiring, attentively profound, always giving, punctilious Mahasiddhi of Southeast Asian art history, bridger of times, leaper of worlds, Professor T.K. Sabapati. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't recognize anything you said. Um, thank you, Simon. And hello, everyone. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a pleasure being here in Kuala Lumpur, um, a pleasure that has been sustained since 1957, give or take a break of five to ten years now and then. <clears throat> but that's not the gist of what I wish to comment on this afternoon. Uh, what I wish to illustrate and talk about is even far more pleasurable than my connections with KL. I have with me a whole bunch of stuff uh, the, a, a kind of a collation of materials. Mm, some of it is textual, words written and now spoken, words recalled, words forgotten, and words set aside, and also a whole bunch of images which will be illustrated on the screen. Uh, in total, about 20 images. And these have to do with Latif's life and a matter which has been talked repeatedly all of this morning, his journeying, his traveling, his moving around. Uh, and in this instance, in one particular location, which is Cambodia. Um, I'll explain the title of the presentation shortly. And in focusing on Cambodia and his, I think, three to four months there, I will primarily deal with a set of writings that Latif put together and published, which, first slide, please. Do I press the slide? First, first image, can I, the first? Yes, which was released as two volumes, parallel with one another, called in Bahasa Malaysia, Garis, and in English, Line by Dewan Bahasa dan Pustaka in 1993. Um, I will, in referring to it, name it as Garis, which has a particular gravitas to it, rather than line, which seems to just peter away into nothing. 
It is made up of writings by Latif Mohidin. They are gathered from a wide range of notes that he describes in characteristically matter-of-fact manner as scribbles and hasty jottings put together throughout the 1960s, but for this purpose edited and enhanced for making it them suitable for publication. Almost 30 years intervene their initial writing and notations and their public appearance. They are hence massively retrospective. One wonders, and I do on many, many occasions, if any of the scribbles and hasty jottings survive in their original material condition. I say, I ask this partly rhetorically and partly seriously because Latif has the continuing surprising and unsurprising habit when you are with him, especially developing a, a, a project or an enterprise to bring out of his pocket or some folder uh, 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 scraps of paper and say, this might interest you, and leaves it there and walks away. And when you look at it, you, you see that this is exactly what you're looking for to, to, miss, to miss the gap somewhere. So I wouldn't at all be surprised if one day these scribbles and jottings do appear in envelopes and folders even as they are enhanced and edited for this publication, they are not dull and they are not flattened and neutralized. On the contrary, they are remarkably endearing and intimate, words which one normally does not associate with writing of any kind these days. We read, when we read them, disclosures that are confessional, Recollections that are vivid, personal, effervescent, etched contemporaneously, that is, with an inflection and a notation of the time at which it happened. Reflections that are at times somber, grave, and regretful. Judgments that are at times unsparing, and at times gracious. We read encounters that are feverish and mischievous, observations that are animated and wondrous, ruminations that are starry-eyed, perceptions that are weighty and fleeting, and quite a number of reports on his well-being and not so well-being and so on. The tone throughout Garis is conversational, anecdotal, and at times even gossipy. Above all, it is trusting. It is in this vein that Ismail Zain, whom we heard in a recording over the lunch period, applauds Garis for its what Ismail refers to as its orality, by which he means that Latif's writings, and we heard a little bit about this when Pauline was, was uh, uh, explicating on his poetry and language, by which Ismail means that Latif's writings are heard like words that are spoken rather than written a distinction that is of immense historical and ideological importance for Ismail. But then that is another story. It must also be said that hearing words as though they are spoken while reading them as they are written are testimonies of Latif's capacities with language, capacities that are deep, vital, and wide. 
And in reading Garis as line, that is to say in the English language, we sense these capacities transferred and conveyed in another language, namely English, testifying to Adiba Amin's brilliance in translation. If you haven't read, read Garis or Line, you haven't lived. I suggest you go and try and get a hold of it and read it. From now on, leave this auditorium and get on reading Garis. Forget about the rest. Simon, that's an assignment. Garis represents a youthful Latif, all of 24, 25, as he steps into and grows in the world, cultivating knowledge of the self and of the world as entwined, although differentiated. He never ceases to do so in actuality and in his imagination. In this sense, to Marantau, which has been talked about before, to Marantau for Latif is virtually a lifelong commitment. In the foreword to Garis and uh, Line, Latif disclaims Garis as autobiography. He says it is not a memoir. Readers think otherwise. Ismail Zain, for instance, whom we heard at has no doubt that it is autobiographical. You will read it in the translated transcri transcript in the handout which you have. Latif also says these publication notes are, and I quote, raw, incomplete, erratic, romantic, passive. At times they are, he also says, stridently clear and at times feeble and so on. In reading him and on writing on him, I cite what he has published in Garis, testing and teasing the validity of what the artist says, of what he thinks and does when analyzing his work and when appraising his art historically. In doing so, I read with and against the grain of what he has written. It is in this spirit that I refer to it today. Encore sketches. Yes, slide two. Yeah, thank you. Encore, Encore sketches, the title for this presentation is the heading of the section on his travels in Cambodia in 1966, as published in Garis, and on the screen is an image of that page. I illustrate some of these sketches or pictures that he has produced, discuss them in relation to Latif's encounters with monuments in Angkor that prompted them, and discuss them in relation to his thoughts on these encounters and in producing these sketches as they are published in Garis. That is to say, what does Latif say at the time that he was in the presence of these monuments, looking at them, walking around them, climbing them, thinking about them, and as we heard a little earlier, writing on them and producing visual representations, which are these sketches. He lists monuments in his visitations. He names them. Many sketches that he produced bear the names of the building sites. So we are, in this sense, on relatively firm grounds of where he was and what he saw. So what I do here uh, set, bes set, beside it, set sketches beside illustrations of monuments. Even as I rely on Latif's own notations, I'm not absolutely sure the matching or pairing I show 
is exactly how it was in 1966 when he was merentawing in Cambodia. Although there are a handful of photographs from his collection, one of which I show, two of which I show here, but I'm confident these juxtapositions are close enough for me to proceed. A word of caution, and, uh, and Simon has already uh, mentioned that, which is as much to myself as to Simon and to, to you, my, my audience. I need to exercise restraint when talking on Cambodian art. Because this art, Khmer art and architecture, formed the anchor of my scholarship in the history of art for the first 15 to 18 years of my studies. The modern came later, although it has prevailed in my life. Yet, and I've said this elsewhere, rather soppily, I write the modern for, by yearning for the past. Hence, Simon, you may have to rein me in, or else I may go on and on about iconologies and cosmologies of Jaya Varman, Surya Varman, Prajna Paramita. How about that? How the Lokateshwara? Man, I got a handful of extra slides that will substitute Latif for them. Yeah. I'll be talking with and around the images on the screen. We begin with remarks that are somewhat arresting and pertinent. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, not yet. The, uh, can we go to the third? Oh, it is all upside down. I'm looking for Latif's remarks on drawing. Yes, sorry. We begin with, remar with remarks that are somewhat arresting and pertinent for thinking on drawing and drawing with and from the world as it is seen. This may well act as provocations for in the first instance, master classes in drawing of certain kinds, but one which will continue to uh, prompt us when we, as, we, as we move along. This appears tucked away in the top corner of a page in Garis, just on its own, unrelated to anything else that subsequently follows or anything else that precedes. And it's so innocu innocuously entered compared to the massive paragraphs that come subsequently that one may, in scanning a page, uh, completely overlook this. And I think uh, it enters into the spirit of that by referring to it notes in the corner of a sketch and one normally skips and, and, and certainly notes. So there they are. An image is created as if to be as if to be a substitute to the object or for an object. And then there is always this disjuncture between what is seen, what is sensed of what is seen, and what is represented. And then when we retrace the steps from trying to get to the original object that might have appeared through the drawing, then this disjuncture dilates and increases. Drawing pervades Latif's artistic world, and drawings are everywhere in Garis. OK, let's now move through the sketches. Can we have? I'm looking for the Cambodian, the map of Southeast Asia. What, what has happened to the order of my slides? They're all absolutely effed up. 
Yes, okay. This is, a, this is just to indicate not the map as it was when Latif journeyed to Cambodia, of course. This is the, the, the map of the monuments, the, the, the chronology and the time at, the, at which these monuments were built. Roughly the 13th century when the Khmer Kingdom was at its most extensive in mainland Southeast Asia. And in this uh, hypothetical recreation of the geographies of the two principal uh, uh, polit polities, as these are called, one is Sri Vijaya, which uh, is in the whole of the maritime Southeast Asia, and then largely the Khmer Kingdom in the um, in mainland Southeast Asia. Next, please. When talking about Khmer art and ar architecture, one normally thinks of these two monuments. Uh, Angkor Wat, built and completed round about the end of the 12th century, which is the image on the left, both, and, and the Bayon, which is on the right, roughly completed in as much as it was completed by the end of the 13th century. And there's no doubt that in terms of architectural design, in terms of sculptural attainment and accomplishment, and in terms of the realization of the imperial or the royal schemes for set, setting up certain royal families in the region of Angkor, that Angkor Wat and the Bayon formed a kind of a climactic movement in Cambodian architecture and art history. I could go on a little bit, or much more on it, but I just will stop myself by saying that of the two, Angkor Wat is the more, is the more completely preserved, uh, whereas the Bayon is knocked around a bit, and the reconstructions have not been totally convincing. If we just stay with the image on, on the left, which is Angkor, the core of the, of the entire temple is, consists of a number of rectangular enclosures which decrease towards the center, and at the very center itself, on an extremely raised platform, are five towers placed at the four cardinal corners and with the central tower marking the absolute center. And so axially, everything culminates in that central tower. There's a walkway or a causeway linking right from the outer perimeter uh, towards the main gateway, giving us access to the main core. The entire precinct of Angkor Wat is surrounded by a moat, and that's the waterway, which in turn this is what I mean here ago, which in turn uh, refers to the uh, uh, cosmography of Mount Meru, which is the mythical mountain round which oceans and, and, and rivers and, and various strata of uh, life exist. And the waterway is the outermost border. And you cross the bridge over the water, and by crossing that, that waterway, you cleanse yourself and increasingly uh, ready yourself for entry into the main core. Um, at, the, at, the, at the heart of the, Cam, uh, at the Khmer uh, architectural scheme is really a simple nuclear unit consisting of, next slide please, um, a, a tower and a podium and uh, a single tower and a podium that could be multiply raised uh, and terraced. And this is uh, one such example of, uh, of, of the early phase of Khmer architecture. And uh, next, these are the kinds of uh, drawings that, that uh, proliferate in, in Garis, in page after page after page. 
uh, Latif is very careful to annotate that the drawings are not necessarily illustrations related to what is said in the text. And neither is the text a commentary on the drawings, that they have separate lives altogether. But occasionally, if one reads the two and reads them in a persuasive manner to try and make connections, one need not leave a page with a feeling of being completely estranged. Uh, there can be certain connections that are forged. Next. Here we go again with the... Uh, I, I will project this uh, um, repeatedly to remind us of the remind us of the kind of a proposition, or at least at least we can raise this as a proposition to think about a certain kind of drawing that could be uh, entered upon. Next. Here we have among the first images uh, of Latif Muhyiddin ascending Mount Meru in, 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 in Cambodia. That on the left is a photograph of him 1966, climbing the steps of Fimianakas. Fimianakas is the second oldest uh, royal temple that was constructed. And that's an image of Fimianakas as it is today, 66 to about, that was taken in 2007, I think. Yes. Next. OK. Um, this is Latif introducing himself into Angkor. The first remark that he makes in sketches to Angkor. Seeing Angkor, fortress, palace, temple, the dream of the ancient Khmer kingdom, now a mere ruin of brick and sand, destroyed by time and the forces of nature. In the 800 years, sometimes I feel like seeing the unfinished works of a great sculptor. Um, the tenor of what he has just said as forthrightly reporting or recording the immediate impact on seeing the physical condition of these structures, hence ruins, the material construction. He's quite right, brick, sand, and various kinds of stone, the predominant kind of stone that is used for purposes of construction and cladding uh, on, on the surfaces is sandstone, which is uh, it's a soft stone that one can carve and polish and engrave. And it's a very, it's a, it's a stone that is extremely expensive to quarry and to, and to finish. And then giving, giving quite an accurate time phase for it, 800 years, which is quite close. And then he rounds off that recollection by inserting his interest in being in Cambodia as a practicing artist. Hence, sometimes I feel like I'm seeing the unfinished works of a great sculptor. If we keep this tripartite um, interest, reporting on what it actually is, and he's an astute, sharp observer, very precise, almost measured in the way he notes his observations. And although he, at some other time he says, I have not sufficiently prepared myself to make this journey, whereas all my companions, and especially those from Germany, again, they have read their, they, they have done their homework in a scholarly manner and are able to enter into discussions of Cambodian art in an insightful, deep ma manner, which I'm not able to. In truth, he knows more than he cares to confess. And I would like to subsequently 
uh, read passages from them. Prakan is a temple which is quite a, quite adjacent to the Bayon, built by the by the maker of the Bayon, the person Jayavarman the Seventh, who built the Bayon, as as a kind of a memorial to his father. Uh, honoring one's ancestors is a is a is a is a deep seated um, is a deep seated uh, acknowledgement that takes on vastly exemplified representations in architectural form, as in this case. He also dedicated, built and dedicated one, one to his mother, which we will, we will meet uh, shortly. Next, please. The Bayon. Um, he returns to the Bayon on a number of, on a number of occasions. And When he encountered this wall, which he refers to as a gallery, and it is referred to as a gallery by the archaeologists themselves and the art historians who look at it, he's struck by the encounter with pictures. This is what he reads on, on these two. There are two exhibition halls at the Bayon. The walls are like pages of a history book with three-tiered carved drawings filled with myriad battles on land and sea. Absolutely spot on. The, 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 these walls and the walls in Angkor Wat, which are very well preserved, are in the majority of instances carved with reliefs displaying the army, the army readying for battle, the army displaying its hardware to its, uh, to its audience, and the army in the thick of battle. This, this preoccupies so much of the, of the carved surfaces on these temples. So, filled with myriad battles on land and sea, interesting is a record of the life of the masses depicting family life, planting, trade, and games, women cooking rice or playing with their children, men in rooster and cockfights, and some apparently looking for lice in one another's hair. A woman about to give birth, that is a drawing of that scene, not by Latif, but by, by the publisher who, from whom I've taken this drawing from, men playing games or buying and selling at a market, loading and unloading goods at a jetty, and so on. Um, the, the admixture of what today we would call, in, in terms of categories in using picture forms, genre scenes. These genre scenes are intermixed with historical episodes and, uh, and, and the, the might of, of the royalty in display. And, um, and Latif observes these. He has made drawings of these himself, although these drawings have never been developed into larger, larger uh, pictures. Next. OK, this is Latif with, among the face. And I thought I'll muscle, muscle my way in, too, and say, like Latif, I, too, have visited the Bayon sometime in my life. So here we are. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, Latif looks much more in, intent, with greater intent in his scrutiny as he looks away. And uh, like a like a like a historian, I I look absolutely oblique and uh, not not quite deciding where I want to focus my my attention. Okay, next. Um, and yeah, okay. Uh, I've lost my way a bit here. Let me just give me a little time. Ah, yes, 11. 
Uh, Pauline has already read this passage, and I will read it again because I, I, I will read it because it is almost indispensable. Um, it appears as if as if materializing and consolidating while journeying. If it is, then it's a remarkable example of focused, distilled, mature thinking on so many aspects and at so many levels. Um, it's a distillation of thoughts on art, thoughts on history, thoughts on human endeavor, um, on the ephemerality of life, and yet the wondrous nature of life as well, of a different kind. Um, let me read it. And it was prompted in seeing structures such as these. So, it is clear to me now, that I like the way he starts, so, it is clear to me now, there are two basic forms of energy. One, the structuring energy behind the rocks of stone, forming them into tears like lotus buds. Two, the cracking energy of the nerve vessels, the patterns of thrusting bunyan roots, the weaving together of its veins like a spread out net. One is man's composition, which seems to reach up to touch the sky. The other is God's creation, which longs to creep, to touch base, to penetrate into the earth in search of water. Two forms of energy that meet, embrace, clash, merge, that overlap, wrestle, intertwine, break away, surrendering only to attack again, meeting and thrashing. Moments pass, days and months pass, seasons, years pass, centuries pass. But the energy of construction and the energy of destruction seem to go on fighting their tremendous battle here, right in front of my eyes. And all the sketches I have worked at all these years, what can I say, are a mere scratch or two of the force of movement and violence, vibration of such events. Mm. Topics and themes, phrases from what I have read from this distillation appear uh, discreetly in so many other ruminations, recollections, observations, and assertions throughout, throughout the section on Angkor. It's not particular to his visit to Angkor, yet uh, it is most forcefully felt and most intensely represented in his experience in Angkor. Let's move on to the next. I now put together the sketches uh, which are annotated by, by way of their medium and then the photograph on the right. Mm. The affinities and affiliations in terms of, how shall I say, um, Transfer, transferring, representing appearance, appearances, um, developing sufficient dexterity, familiarity, and ability with 
the kind of medium that he's employing, the pictorial medium he's, he's employing. And all these, the, all, all, all these are being, being cultivated, developed, explored, if you wish, experimented with in situ while, while he was there. Um, of the more elaborate ones, especially requiring um, a special kind of paper, requiring additional medium like watercolor, gouache, pen and ink. These are subsequent developments of initial drawings. So the initial drawings are the, are the original notations and these are elaborated upon subsequently. Um, yes, here's, here's another, another pair, Tarsom, um, a building that is pretty much swallowed up by the tree. And hence here you could say that in the, in the eternal conflict that he says, battle between nature, and I have referred to this as between nature and artifice. Artifice being the fabrication of human beings and nature being what that is. And nature which Latif also is very punctilious and uh, attentive to giving it and providing it with a divine origin. He says, these are God's creation. Um, without, without intending this to be a theological, um, theological exemplification or a theological utterance, but the wonder of, of nature being, of being divinely sourced. I think this is what, this is what he means. So this conflict between nature, <clears throat> nature and artifice is one that, that that threads right through his thinking. Aspects of that was mentioned a little earlier on in terms of flourishing, fertilizing, growing, and on the other hand, of depleting, of diluting, degrading, and dying too. I think these are, these are implicated and imbricated in in some of these remarks, and perhaps in the interpretation of some of these sketches. Let me not lose sight of the sequence of these things. Yes, okay, here we are back again at Prague Khan. That's okay. Yes. Um, that, that image on the right is, is quite interesting because it begins, in my opinion, it begins to leave the field, so to speak. Um, increasingly, Latif begins to, even in situ, in the presence of these, of these ruined and broken monuments and buildings, um, begins to employ a pictorial visual vocabulary that no longer is dependent on deriving appearances. Um, he increasingly develops confidence in, in his visual formation. And the visual formation in turn takes an internal life of its own and determines its own um, detailed formation. And it is in these ways that the vitality, the dynamism, can be seen as being symbolized and completely encapsulated in the picture itself, and not necessarily indebted to what is visible and indebted to the appearance of the object seen in the first instance. And in that, in that, um, reference to the conflict between nature and artifice where I talked about the bunyan trees and the roots and the branches dipping itself into the earth, burrowing itself, snaking itself, 
serpent-like. I use, I use these terms deliberately because I'm building up to the next lot of observations and into water. Now, this is my interpretation. I'm not at all imputing or implicating Latif in this. Can, in my opinion, be seen analogously, analogously with the veneration that the Khmer people had for the Naga, the serpent. Um, next, next slide. Yes, I come back to Angkor Wat and that long walkway, sometimes it's referred to as the causeway. Those of you who have walked walk, walk, walk down that path might remember it. It's accompanied on both sides by the coils of a serpent, which is stretched out. It's not, it's not coiled, it's stretched out. And held by gigantic figures who are standing on either side. And right at the, the initial steps when you get into the pathway, the, the, the head of the serpent widens out into a seven hooded representation. And the, the number seven, the numerological, numerological symbolism is deliberate. But that serpent is the symbol of water which surrounds Angkor Wat. The, the symbolic idea is that the serpent resides in the water. The, 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 the Naga is a water symbol and from time to time rises from the water in order to be in the world and to activate the world. And it is the Naga that is amphibious. It's, it's both on land and in the water. And in the, in the Chinese system, the, the Naga is Ariel, the dragon. It is the Naga, but it's up there. Um, so we, we, we have all, all three elements uh, covered, so to speak, uh, connected by, by, the, by the Naga. And next, next slide. And, and the most dramatic exemplification of the Naga is this relief in Angkor Wat, which is called the, <laughs> it's translated from command Sanskrit as the churning of the ocean. And that's, it's a, it's a creation myth where the Naga is brought up from the bottom of the ocean and then uh, devas and asuras, the good guys and the bad guys, both are needed, one cannot do with the other, uh, are, are, are caught in a tug of war on each end. Yes, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. And as they push and pull round a pillar, and that pillar churns, Zabas talked about disturbance. No disturbance, no nothing. So that, that disturbance has to take place from that disturbance, from a condition of stasis, stillness, to a condition of activity. And then the seven primary jewels come out, which then cause both mayhem and great things, of course. And then, then life begins at that point. Life begins at that point. Uh, and, and here, here are representations of the Naga. This may, may or may not surprise some of you to see the Buddha image associated with the Naga. And that, that image on the right is the central image in the Bayon. It's the dedicated image to the Bayon. And the Buddha on, on the Naga, what, what is the Buddha doing on the Naga? Yeah. How did they come together? There are several representations of it and several narratives related to this. I will not detain, detain you with this. If you are interested, we'll have it, have it over a cup of coffee later on. But the main thing is the Naga in this instance has also is associated with a kind of a, a fluorescence of internal energy inside a being. And this energy, this energy in large measure lies dormant and from time to time it's, it springs into activity or it can be 
transformed from a dormant state to an active state. And when it is active, it then coils upwards. When it is dormant, it subsides and coils within itself. So here is the Buddha associated with the uncoiling of this energy, and he then marks the apogee of that appearance. And so he is right in the midst. Of course, contrasted with the Judeo-Christian Judeo world, we have a different vision of the serpent there, uh, which is completely unrelated in this instance. It's not that the Naga and the serpent is not seen as harmful, but it has a transcendental status and role as well. And it's this transcendental role that we are seeing here. Next. And then, of course, it gets into rather esoteric kind of emblematic uh, diagrams and, and systematizations used for aids for, for all kinds of stimulus. And here are such examples of that. Next. This is the only one that I know of which has been published, a published uh, a, a sketch or drawing by Latif in which the Naga is represented. It's the only one. Uh, I, have, I have not come across any other. It doesn't mean that none of this exist, but this, this is the closest. You can see the two Nagas coming, coming from the two extremities towards the end, to, towards the center. I, I, b before we leave that, I want to reiterate that this analogy that I am drawing is mine. Uh, it's not imputed, it is not intended as being intrinsically or inherently symbolic in Latif's thinking when he was producing this. It's most unlikely. Uh, yeah, I just want to conclude uh, the, the presentation of the, of the images uh, whereby the shift away from, from, from appearance and what we started off, the relationship between the drawing and the object that might have prompted the drawing uh, is about now complete by the time we get to this uh, to this uh, to these to these drawings mm. yes um, I've taken us into Angkor I, ne I need to take us out of Angkor we don't want to be there forever what? Oh, we can come back, yes. Yes. Um, and much has been made about Latif's travel, traveling, marantawing uh, everywhere. Um, he has, he asks the value of this himself. I mean, we, we, we um, who speak on his behalf uh, forward this as something that's benign, something that is heavenly bestowed or bestowed on him by, by, by the great powers, and then which he himself lives out with such amiability and such conviviality. But from time to time, he, he pricks this bubble. I think he pricks the bubble in his own reckoning, and he pricks the bubble in our reckoning of him. Here, here's a short paragraph on which he, which he titles as The Meaning of Experience. What preoccupies me a week after returning from roving and painting having come home. The whole point of Marantau is always to return, and ne never to not return. Having come home with several coatings of the colors of my travel is, what really is the meaning or the final evaluation of those experiences for me? Surely not just memories or sentiments arising from incidents and tales along the way. There must be something deeper, something that contains the meaning of one's total experience. And he leaves it at that, as something that can only remain unsaid, unstated, 
unconcluded and unfinished. So the, 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 what does it all mean is either not significant or not sayable or best left as a question and no further. So the merentawing, while necessary, vital, and almost a defining attribute of both his life and his artistic practice, is not completely satisfactory or not completely knowable as to its final concluding moments. Um, he leaves Cambodia rather hurriedly and hurriedly. <laughs> All his travels have been by road, bicycle, on the becha, on the motorcycle, walking, hitchhiking, um, nights at the most inexpensive, sometimes at bus stops, open air. And so he says, tomorrow I must get up at four before dawn and leave all these forms and atmosphere from a past age. At sharp five, I must be at the Siem Reap bus station to leave for Bangkok. But my eyes refuse to close in sleep and my body is still sweaty. So I reach for my sketchbook, scrutinize again the energy of the lines, the specks of fleeting past impressions. But looking again at the series of sketches made throughout my stay at Angkor still fails to bring drowsiness. And so, yes, take the colors of ink and start scratching, lines, scratching, lines, scratching, all day long, all night long. For three nights, I have not slept well. He, he's full of these, how shall I say, self-complaints, but we read them. Last night, I moved four times, looking for a place to lie down and sleep soundly, choosing a <laughs> congenial floor. I wonder what that is. The heat is sizzling, the air feels rough, the earth is damp, mosquitoes are on the rampage, attacking the mosquito nets again and again. Ants are crawling on the floor near me, species I have never seen before in my life. I grab a handful from the back of my neck, the rest overrun my hair. Where do I find water in the middle of the night? So it's like his roots sinking into the earth and looking for water. So um, with Latif, we take leave of Angkor. And can I have one more? I think, yes. What is the impact of Angkor on, on, on Latif at that time, uh, close to that time? Um, he visits Java and Bali. And this is, a, this is a sketch he makes of Gua Gaja. Um, and he has a note on it. And, and I take this not as an indictment of Bali or Java, but of Latif's attitude and condition post Angkor. Um, thus, early this morning, I went down to the rice fields no, not of course to work on them. The first place I went to was Guagaja, not very far from Badulu town where I am, a 11th century cave. However, as I drew, sketched the shape of a giant's mouth, leaf, root, and motif, cliffs, and all that, I felt nothing, absolutely nothing. I didn't feel anything out of the ordinary. 
Perhaps after the Angkor experience, other stone images become less exciting. I pause there and yes, I think I have one more image, but not not don't don't bring it on yet. That's a, a kind of a coda if if I get an opportunity to say something. Simon, I'm at your mercy. At Silakan, Prof. Silakan. No, you want to? Recorder? No. Oh, uh, no, I wait. All right. For you. Okay. Um, well, I guess I want to thank uh, Professor Sabapati for taking us on this rather pleasurable journey.